Russia's invasion of Ukraine is reigniting fears of nuclear escalation. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres saying that the prospect of nuclear conflict, once unthinkable, is now back within the realm of possibility. Along with spiking geopolitical tensions, economies recovering from the pandemic are also facing soaring inflation. So how best to navigate these waters? Well, my next guest has survived and flourished in tumultuous times. I am delighted to welcome back legendary investor and best-selling author Jim Rogers. Jim is also the co-founder of the Quantum Fund and the creator of the Rogers International Commodities Index. So good to have you back with us, Jim. Well, Michelle, I'm delighted to see you. But Michelle, I make a lot of mistakes. I'm just a simple person. Well, you know, Jim, not according to our previous interview, and I will run through that and the advice that you gave our viewers then and how it would have served them well had they listened to it. But we will get to that particularly about buying commodities, as you suggested they should about 11 months ago. But let's start off in a similar vein that I started our conversation last time. And I didn't really want to start again this way, but it's such an apt line that I kind of have to, because you like to say that the main lesson in history is that people don't learn from the lessons of history. And it seems like it's never been more applicable than now. So Jim, how do you apply that to the current macroeconomic environment? Macroeconomic environment? Well, it's a, war is never good for anybody. Never good, well, a few people, but war is never good for anybody and certainly not for any economy. It usually leads to higher prices. It usually leads to disrupted trade, it leads to losses, bankruptcies. No, war has never been good for anybody, including this one. Yeah, and, and, and people don't seem to learn that lesson, Jim. But look, we are now in week three of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and we're learning that the possibility of a Russian strike on a NATO member is closer than ever. March 13th, Russia attacked a military training site in western Ukraine. That's just a dozen miles from the Polish border. And that is prompting concerns that Poland, which is a NATO member, could either intentionally or accidentally become embroiled here, which could then in turn trigger Article 5, which states an attack on one is an attack at all. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the U.S. needs to jump in. But Jim, how do you see this playing out? This conflict isn't getting resolved as efficiently as one would think President Putin hoped it would. Do you think this Russian invasion escalates or do you envision some kind of diplomatic off-ramp here? Well, back to history, many wars wound up by accidents, you know. One guy does this, one guy does that, and the next thing you know, everybody's shooting at us. Go back to 1914. Six months after the war started, people said, how did this happen? How could this be? How do we get out of this? It was all one accident after another, but many wars are one accident after another. And this could happen here. And that's another main lesson from history we don't learn. Is this going to escalate? I don't think so, Michelle, only because the markets say it's probably not going to escalate. I mean, the commodity markets are calming down. Uh, energy prices are coming down. If we were all worried that this was going to end in war, I mean, oil would be $200. Gold would be 3000 So the markets are saying to me, now the markets make many mistakes, just like I do. But the markets are saying to me, somebody's going to figure out a way to stop this. Right. No, you're right. Overall, one does get the sense that the markets are volatile and jittery, but that a real escalation and a major spillover into other countries, that is not being factored according to the market reaction. But as you say, the markets aren't always right, but if they are right, what kind of off-ramp could you envision happening here that sort of eases the situation? Uh, let's say it does calm down. I would suspect that market stock markets, especially, would go through the roof because then people would sigh a sigh of relief. And central banks are not going to be as aggressive as raising interest rates as they were three months ago. And so markets will go to the roof. We'll have one huge rally, probably the last rally. This has been going on since 2009. So that would probably be the last rally. It might be a wonderful rally. And if I if it happens, I hope I'm smart enough to sell that rally. I have not been selling yet. That might make me sell and sell short. Hmm. OK, before I get into that last rally, if you don't mind trying to get you to put on your uh, political analyst hat here, what do you think could be a way out of this as, as a 
well-traveled, well-experienced person, have you sort of contemplated what could be the diplomatic off-ramp here? Michelle, this never should have happened in the first place. I mean, in 2008, the U.S. said we're going to take Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. And Russia said, what? No, you're not. We're not going to let you do that. 2014, Washington instigated a coup in Kiev, in, in Ukraine, put in one of their governments. And Mo Moscow said, what? You can't do that. Suppose we put in our own government in Mexico. And now, of course, you see what's happening. NATO kept getting closer and closer and closer to Russia. Listen, I'm not a fan of any of these guys, but this is what was happening. And so Putin, rightly or wrongly, wrongly usually, but said, I'm not going to let this happen. I have to go to war. Now, that's never the right answer, but that's what he said. So if you ask me, the only way out of this is for Ukraine to say, OK, we will never join NATO. And for NATO to say, OK, well, Ukraine will never be in, in NATO, neither will Georgia. And we'll all go and drink vodka together or tea or whatever you want to drink. Yeah, you know, you would think that that sort of diplomatic uh, solution should have been proposed before all of this unnecessary bloodshed. And it, one wonders if one can now take that position, given how far we've come. But let's assume that there is a diplomatic resolution here. I want to focus back on the fact that you said that would then lead to the last rally. Expand on that for us. Well, Michelle, the market has been going up since 2009. It's the longest in U.S. history. I'll use the U.S. since it's the largest market. Longest in U.S. history. Maybe it could go up for 30 years without big declines, but it never has. So we see Inflation coming back, inflation always leads to higher interest rates. So there are plenty of reasons for the markets to come to an end. Most assets around the world are forming bubbles. Bonds are certainly a bubble. You know, property in many places is a bubble. This has all got to come to an end. And it looks to me like if we have one big last blow off rally, that will be the last one. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's going to go on another 12 years. So I'm curious what would trigger the end of that rally, if not the current environment that we have right now, if it survived this unprecedented fiscal and monetary stimulus in response to a global pandemic. And now we're seeing uh, Eastern Europe at war, the closest, I arguably, that the globe has been to a potential world war in a very long time. And yet, despite that, that isn't going to cause the end of the rally in, in your estimation. So what would? What kind of well, event would actually cause that to happen? Well, Michelle, interest rates are the lowest in recorded history. Interest rates have never been this low, certainly not in, in North America and everywhere. And they have to go higher because inflation is higher. And you're not going to sit around and lending money at 0% when you're when inflation is 9 or 10%. So it, rising interest rates will certainly uh, be a factor in what's going on, as well as inflation. That hurts a lot of people, hurts a lot of buying power and c corporate earnings. So all of this coming together. And what ends many bull markets is it just gets too high and there's nobody left to buy. You know, at the end of all bull markets, we have a lot of new people coming into the markets and they say, oh, I've just discovered this wonderful thing called the stock market and it's fun and you can make money and it's easy. Well, they're all coming again and talking about how easy it is to make money. We've seen this. I've seen this rodeo before. Yes. Yes, you have. And you've profited it quite handsomely from it. Now, uh, Jim, let's speaking about inflation, because last time you were on the show about 11 months ago, we discussed inflation and you said brace yourself for inflation, that there is no way all of this stimulus does not result in a surge in inflation. And we do have inflation at a four decade high now. So what do you expect from the Fed, we have a meeting on Wednesday, a 25 basis point hike is expected, which really won't do much to tame the inflation that we're in. But what do you think is uh, the Fed's ability to tame inflation, especially with this new geopolitical risk? 
Well, Michelle, very few central banks ever in history have gotten it right about anything. You know, the best thing they could all do is resign, stop printing money and resign, let the market just determine interest rates. They're not going to do that because they want to keep their jobs. That, that's for sure. But yes, they'll raise interest rates. At least the market says they'll raise interest rates. But remember, they were talking about a half percent a few weeks ago, uh, and they're talking about several interest rate hikes in 2022. Yeah. I doubt if we'll have that now, but we will have inflation because, Michelle, I mean, whenever they print a lot of money, it's always led to higher inflation. I'm, I'm, I'm not very smart, but I know because I can read that printing money leads to inflation. And that's what's happening. And they're not going to stop printing money. If they do, they're not going to stop printing. Maybe they're not going to print as fast or as much. But these guys are not going to risk their jobs. They don't care about you and me. They care about their jobs. All right. So you don't expect any aggressive action from the Fed. And arguably, even if the Fed did act more aggressively, it's uncertain what impact that would have uh, on inflation, especially as we're sort of juggling this e economic recovery. Now, 11 months ago, Jim, I asked you, how can our viewers protect their portfolios against the inflation that you were predicting? And you said, buy commodities. I asked you what specifically, and you said that one just couldn't go wrong with the RJI Commodities Index. Well, that is over 56% year over year and over 27% year to date. So. You definitely called that one correctly. If we weren't smart enough to listen to you then, Jim, is it too late to listen to you now? Can one still make that play into the RJI Commodities Index? I think I better stop while I'm ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, maybe a RJA, you could buy agriculture. Agriculture is still incredibly cheap on a historic basis. But most commodities, well, I'd say RJI or RJA. RJA would probably be better because it's purely agriculture. And agriculture, Michelle, agriculture has been a disaster for a long, long, long time. The average age of farmers in America is 58 years old. More people study public relations than study agriculture in America. So something's got to happen. We're not going to have any clothes. We're not going to have any food. So I would buy agriculture. Okay, so the best way to protect a portfolio or to benefit from the current crisis that we're in is to invest in agricultural commodities. Well, yes, that's right. That's exactly what I just got through saying. Or you could watch Kitco. Kitco can tell you ways to do these things. Kitco has been giving people advice since I was a kid. Just, just well, maybe so not since I. Yeah, since I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if we've been around that long for at least the new sector, but just summarizing your, your position there, because look, you know, you called it right. So does that mean that you're not that bullish on hard commodities and a potential commodity super cycle in hard commodities with the exception of agricultural commodities? I got silver. I didn't buy it from Kitco, but I've got silver, you know, and everybody can get silver. I'm not buying it at the moment. Because if the war ends or something, they'll go down for a while. And I, I do plan to buy more silver and probably more gold in the next correction. Because before this is over, Michelle, everybody is going to own a lot of gold and silver. They always do when there's a big crisis and big turmoil. All right. Well, there are concerns of a recession and even worse, stagflation. Stagflation, if we do get a slowing growth with rising inflation, so again, other than the agricultural commodities, what would that mean for hard commodities that are intended to benefit from things like the trend to decarbonize? Do you still see a rally there? Well, silver, uh, yes. Silver, when yeah. They, when, the, when they correct, which they will at the end of the war, or when the war ends, I suspect silver and gold will be very good over the next five, few, several years after they correct, because they're going to be more turmoil, going to be problems, more money printing. I mean, whenever people lose confidence in currency or in governments, they buy gold and silver, despite what the politicians tell you, despite what the academics say. Michelle, I'm an old peasant, and us old peasants know that when things go wrong, we want some silver in the closet. We want some gold under the bed, because... We want to survive. 
Are you adding to your gold and silver positions at this at this current level? No, 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 not now. I'm waiting for something to happen to cause a correction. I mean, both have been going up a, a lot in the last year or so. So no, no, I'd rather wait, buy when things go down. I learned that from Kitco, buy low, <laughs> not buy high. And we will see. All right, well, you have said, speaking of gold and silver, and dollar debasement. You have said that a casualty of this conflict could likely be the US dollar as a global reserve currency, that the dominance of the US dollar is potentially at risk here because it's being used as a political tool in this conflict. Can you expand on that for us? A a reserve currency or an international medium of exchange is supposed to be neutral. Anybody should be able to use it for anything buy drugs, pay your girlfriend, buy gold, (laughs) buy a car, whatever you want. Uh, But the U.S. is now changing those, has changed those rules and said, wait a minute, if we get angry at you, you're not going to be able to U.S. dollars. So many people are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm not going to pull my dollars. Russia, China, India, many countries are looking for an alternative or a competitor to the U.S. dollar for political reasons but also for economic reasons. The U.S. is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. No international medium of exchange has lasted more than 100, 150 years, 80 years, whatever. The U.S. has been on top a long time, so it's coming to an end. I don't like saying it. I'm an American, for goodness sakes, but I, I have to face facts or I'll go down the tubes like everybody else. No, I can see what's happening. Many, many people, even friends of the U.S. are now saying, wait a minute, we got to be careful because these guys could freeze us. They could lock us out of the system and then we're doomed. So given the fact that the U.S. dollar has been used to curtail Russia's aggression, you're saying that that serves to accelerate the pace of its demise as a global reserve currency as the king of all currencies. Do you have a a timeline that you care to put out there where you think this could happen by? Hmm. It's not going to happen in March 2022, I assure you, but they're all working on it now. They have been working on it, trying to come up with a competitor. I don't know what what it's going to be. If you know, Michelle, please don't say it out loud. Send me an email (laughs) so I can buy it too. I'm looking for what's going to replace or compete with the U.S. dollar. But think about all the countries in the world that could have a problem with the U.S. They're thinking the same thing. I mean, Washington has sent everybody an email saying, be careful. I mean, China, Russia, Iran, India, Brazil, many of these countries are already trying to figure out, okay, what do we do? to find something to compete with or maybe even replace the U.S. dollar. I don't know what it is yet. I wish I did. So is it likely to be another fiat currency or as many are suggesting that this is where Bitcoin, for example, comes in and fills the void? Well, I don't see it being a Bitcoin. It might be an electronic currency, but it would be a government currency. Governments are not going to give up their power. They're not going to give up their monopoly. At least they never have. I don't think, you know, every government in the world is working on computer money now. In China, you can't take a taxi with with Chinese money. You can't buy an ice cream with Chinese money. You can only use computer money. But that's happening all over the world. The U.S. is working on it. And when the U.S. says, okay, this is money now, I don't think Washington is going to say, but If you want to use that money over there, you can use their money too. That's not the way the U.S. government works. It's not the way these people think. But is it likely that the Chinese renminbi fills that void? Okay, I hear your point that governments and central banks aren't going to let an outsider like Bitcoin take over that role. Um, But is it likely that China could, considering that China has even more regulations and controls over its currencies than the dollar and the digital version of the Chinese yuan, their central bank digital currency is used to excessively monitor the the population and obliterates all privacy. So again, I'm curious to know which country's sovereign currency could step in. 
Well, you make a very good point. Uh, first of all, the, the renminbi is not even convertible right now, so it's a little bit ludicrous to think it could be the world's medium of exchange or international currency. Now, they're trying to make it convertible. They have been for a few years, but it's not convertible yet, so a non-convertible currency cannot do it. That's part of the reason I don't know what is, is mm. going to happen. And gov- to your point, good point, governments love electronic money because they know everything you do. They'll call you up one day, Michelle, and say, you've been drinking too much tea this month. Stop drinking so much tea. Coffee. Whatever you. I do drink too much coffee, Jim. Okay, coffee, (laughs) coffee, coffee. Well, I've got some coffee right here. They'll call me up and say, you've had too much espresso. Slow down. Yeah, uh, they love it. They, lo- I don't love it. I wish that we could have more privacy, more, more freedom. But that's not the way governments think. I don't like that. But I have to face facts. They have the guns. I don't. Yeah. Well, the the concept of a central bank digital currency is very disconcerting on many fronts, and certainly the idea of complete lack of privacy and authoritarian control is right up there. Uh, on the top of the agenda of what worries me about CBDCs. Now, I know you're in Singapore. You're joining us from Singapore this morning. You're having your coffee. Uh, You're there because of your long-held belief in the growing influence of Asia and the rise of China. And Jim, you quite correctly saw China being able to shift its economy from a manufacturing-led economy to a consumer-driven one. You called that correctly. How do you see China fitting into the global dynamics with this current conflict with Russia? Because there are reports that China has expressed some openness to providing Russia with requested military and financial assistance. Officials from the US and China reportedly met on Monday in Rome to discuss Russia's war in the Ukraine. Reportedly intense talks spanning at least seven hours. It's not confirmed to what degree China is saying it'll help Russia, as I mentioned, just reports on that so far. But do you have any insight into how you see the government of Xi Jinping playing out this geopolitical dynamic? Well, we, China and Russia are getting closer together. And unfortunately, Washington is pushing them closer and closer together. because We're fighting with both of them. I don't like it at all. If you look at a map, Oh my gosh, you see how big China and Russia are? Who wants to fight those two countries combined? But we're pushing them together. Uh, and yes, China says they're going to give weapons or sell weapons to Russia. But well, we're they haven't said that yet. They haven't confirmed that yet. Okay. I am sure that somewhere somebody in Russia is getting weapons from China, just like Ukraine is getting weapons from the U.S. and, and Europe. Whether it's above board or below board, it's happening. And it will happen more and more. They're friends, they're pals. I don't know how we, the U.S., can tell people you cannot be friends with somebody else. Michelle, I cannot tell you who you can be friends with. I don't want to. I don't want to try. But the U.S. is now telling China you cannot be friends with Russia, which, of course, makes them want to be friends even more. So how is this going to play out? Russia and China are getting closer and closer together, but we're forcing them to do that. Whether this leads to war in Asia or not soon, I I, I don't know. I hope not. But if I were China and I ever wanted to have war over Taiwan, Mm. this would be more or less the best time to do it because the rest of the world is distracted by other things. I'm not suggesting they will. I'm just sitting here saying, well, if I were thinking about war over Taiwan, it's a good time. Well, unfortunately, Jim, you're not the only one to put out that hypothesis because there is growing concern that this conflict emboldens China to be more aggressive with Taiwan. You just said that if you were China, you would find it an opportune time to do that. But how likely do you think it is that it happens? First of all, if I were China, I would say, I'll just wait. China's been around hundreds, thousands of years, and they, they know patience better than many people. So if I were China, I'd just say, I'll wait. Don't worry. Look at a map. It's going to be part of China again someday. So that's what I would do. But I'm not China. They're thinking their own way. And this is probably a good time to do it. I doubt that it's going to happen this year. But the head of China has said he wants it to happen. He seems to be worried about his place in history. I'm not sure that this would be great for him in history, but he seems to think so. So maybe they'll do something foolish. Michelle, history shows us 
politicians have made unbelievable mistakes yeah. throughout history. I was talking about the First World War before. Everybody said, how did this happen? How do we get out of this? But it was too late. They'd already stumbled into this war. And there are many cases like that in history. If I were China, I would wait. But China may not want to wait. As an investor, is this something that one should be thinking about? The possibility of China taking more aggressive action with Taiwan and the ramifications that that could have? Or is that a little too far out there for an investor to focus on at this point? Well, you have to think about it. You have to think about the possibility because you have to be prepared for it if it happens. The Chinese market has been pretty weak recently. Maybe that's because of real estate, but maybe it's because somebody knows there's going to be a war in Asia. Uh, war will not be good for anybody in Asia. It's not even China, even if they initiate it. Maybe that's why the markets are going down. I don't know. But you know, I have to think about everybody watching this show has to think about the possibility of war in Asia. And what do we do if it happens? So I said before, the markets are saying to me, at least the commodity markets are saying to me, things are going to calm down. But the Chinese stock market is dropping like a rock. Yeah. Well, what do we do? Should that happen? Is there any position to take at this point on the off chance that that happens? Some kind of hedge? Commodities throughout history, commodities go through the roof when there's a war. Right. It, it, wars may be good for the few generals, few politicians, but they're always good for copper. They're always good for commodities. You know, people need lead when there's a war. They need this stuff when there's a war and they buy it. Well, speaking of Chinese equities, uh, the Chinese stocks trading in the U.S., as you just mentioned, they have been hammered. Alibaba, for example, the stock sinking towards a six-year low. Chinese ADRs have been taking a huge hit. Is there an opportunity there, at least in the short term, to, to get into that? Well, I suspect there are. Uh, I don't own Chinese ADRs. The Chinese shares I own, I own in China or, or in Hong Kong or in, in Shanghai. Uh, but I'm sure there is. I don't know if I'd buy ADRs because apparently the Americans are going to throw them out. Hmm. But you can you can buy Alibaba at other markets if you want to buy Alibaba. I do not own it, but if you want to, the great opportunities. I'm sure. Well, you have said that you do have a bit of a philosophy of buying what you call hated assets. You mentioned in an interview in December in 2020 that Russian stocks were one such opportunity. Back when I was at Bloomberg, you even mentioned to me that you were very interested in investing in Russia. So we've chatted about that before. Moral objections aside, do you still like Russian equities at this point? I do, but you can't buy them. I wish you could, uh, because if all the markets are closed, the currency markets are closed, yes. I have learned if you buy countries that are hated or that are in disasters when there's a war, you usually wind up okay down the road. As far as moral objections, I, I, I'm not supporting Russia, so don't misunderstand. But yeah. there are many people in the world who don't, don't quite buy the propaganda coming out of Washington. If you go to India or many other countries and say, wait a, wait a minute, what are you talking about? What is this stuff you're putting out? So somebody... A few million people, a few hundred million people have a different view of the moral imperatives here. I'm against all of them. I'm against all the wars. But there are people on both that not everybody buys Washington propaganda. Fair enough. Fair enough. And to your point, India has not been as cooperative as Washington would like, at least in terms of how it responds to Russia and Russia's economy. But given the global response at large, how do you see that altering Russia's economic future? Because we've had a mass exodus of global brands, certainly big international corporations like uh, McDonald's, for example. If there is a diplomatic solution, sanctions are still very much likely to be in place for at least several years. So what do you think the long-term impact of this current conflict is going to have on Russia's economy? Well, Michelle, there's various studies which show that sanctions really don't work, academic studies. I'm not the first person, and I've certainly in my observations in my lifetime, sanctions are great for a week or two for some politicians because they say, see, we taught them, we taught them a lesson. But we've had sanctions against Cuba for decades. We've had sanctions against North Korea for decades. 
things should really have a very bad track record other than for a few people for a few weeks because the market always figures out a way to get around them. So yes, there will be sanctions against somebody in the future, but I'm not a fan of sanctions. Uh, I'm not I'm not advocating what the Russians are doing. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that history shows sanctions are not very effective and don't really work. So you don't think that they would have a severe crippling impact on Russia's economy? No, I mean, listen, the, the, when, the, when Russia was the Soviet Union, Oh, my gosh, you couldn't do anything. Everybody had sanctions and laws and all the rest of it, including the communists. They were closed off to the rest of the world. Somehow or another, Russia survived, and somehow there were people who got successful and, and made money. Uh, so I, as that example and many others show, countries can survive no matter how hard the sanctions are and no matter how hard the restrictions are. I didn't say things were great under the Soviet Union, but they were surviving. There were people who did well. Well, I do want to take us back to one of the times that you did very, very well in a somewhat similar environment, the Quantum Fund, which you co-founded in the early 1970s. That had a return of 4,200%. That's 4,200% throughout the 1970s into the early 80s. And that was during a period of double-digit inflation, and similar geopolitical tensions. So how were you able to beat the markets by such a considerable margin during one of the highest inflationary periods in the US of the 20th century? And can any of that apply to now? Well, who knows if I, I, don't, I don't think, I know I'm not gonna do that kind of stuff again, because. I loved what I was doing. I was working very, very hard. Still love what I'm doing, but I'm not working nearly as hard as I did then. There were many opportunities that we took advantage of all over the world, and we used a lot of leverage. I don't use much leverage now because I, I hope I don't need to. Uh, those are some of the reasons we had success, but we also saw the inflation. The inflation was very clear to then, and it is to me now with all the money printing. So I've told you, if you can find assets that are going to go up in price during inflation, you will be successful. That is one way to be successful. Or if you can find hated assets, usually if you buy hated assets, you will be successful over time. I went to Venezuela last year. You know, Venezuela's hated, and my God, it was it is a disaster, and it was a disaster. Then America put sanctions on, so I cannot invest in Venezuela. But that's the kind of place hmm. that if you get it right when there's a disaster on, you will probably be successful in a few years. I'm not advocating Venezuela. It's illegal for me now. But it might have been an opportunity. It is for some people where it's not illegal. And that's another thing about sanctions. You know, if country A puts sanctions on a country, then country B, C, and D say, ah, Here's an opportunity. The Americans cannot invest there, like Cuba right now. Americans can't invest there. So other countries are rushing in as fast as they can. Wouldn't you like to have an economy where you don't have to compete with America? Oh, that'd be great for any kind of business. It's not good for Americans, but it's good for other countries. All right. So... It's not that easy to invest in these countries, uh, legal aspects aside. Are there any emerging markets that an investor can get exposure to right now that you, or any particular sectors within emerging markets that you think are poised to benefit? Well, travel, tourism, transportation have been whacked by the virus and all of the restrictions that are going on in the world. There are probably very good opportunities in those, in those sectors because of what's been going on. I mentioned agriculture before. Yeah. Agriculture in many countries will do, do extremely well, already is starting to do extremely well in many places. There are always some opportunities. Uh, gold and silver, when they, when they correct, will probably be good places. Yeah, but Michelle, look out the window. Travel, transportation, tourism, all these places have been killed. These markets have been killed in many countries. So those are probably opportunities. Um, a couple of African countries that might be very useful going forward. Uh, 
South America, uh, Colombia is probably okay, Venezuela, but I'm not, uh, I'm American, so I cannot invest in Venezuela. Interestingly enough, Washington has been going to Venezuela recently saying, oh, hello, you want to be our friend? <laughs> Washington, which was shrieking about Venezuela for three or four years, now they're saying, oh, we'd like to be your friend again. That always happens. That has caused uh, a lot of, uh, shall we say, a controversy, considering that that is in response to soaring oil prices. And many would say that the U.S. should perhaps be taking a more friendly approach to American oil and gas companies rather than uh, looking to the likes of Venezuela and Iran to uh, bolster oil supplies. Uh, but uh, before we wade into that uh, big political controversial topic, Jim, I always like to try and end things off with a positive note. Give me the good news, Jim. The good news is we're going to survive. Don't worry. <laughs> the world <laughs> will survive. And if you have the right investments that you know a lot about, you will survive. A lot of people came out of the Great Depression, out of the 30s, very, very rich. Not many, but the ones who understood what was going on made a lot of money. The Asians have a word. In China, it's Weiji. Korea has the same character. Japan, basically what it means is opportunity and disaster are the same thing. Now, they've been around longer than we have. We don't have that word in English, but the Asians have it. So, Michelle, yes, look out the window, find some disaster and figure out if there's a good way to invest. And I, I know you want to stop, but back to that last point about oil. It is stunning to me that Washington says, OK, we need more oil. We'll get it from Venezuela and Iran, but not from Oklahoma. Right. Not, we won't take it from Colorado or Texas, our own people. Well, why do you think that that's the position? Because uh, seeing as we've touched on it, it is a very controversial position because it does seem as though the Biden administration is what many are calling is waging a war on American oil and gas companies with undue restrictions and regulations. And first week in office, uh, President Biden canceled the Keystone Pipeline and approved the Nord Stream 2 pipeline between Russia and, and Germany. So what do you think is behind this, shall we say, unusual energy policy? Is it this, this climate change agenda? Well, well, climate change, what is that? They got to get the oil somewhere. Well, the, the, the <laughs> move from the left to decarbonize and the, the aggressive move for uh, net zero emissions and the move from the left, is, is, is that what sort of creating this, what many call as an, an extreme adverse response or reaction to the local oil and gas sector? Well, you would have to ask Mr. Biden, but my point is wherever the oil comes from, it's still oil. You know, whether it comes from Venezuela or Colorado, it's still yeah. oil and somebody, if they think that's bad for the world, it's still bad for the world. I don't, I don't understand it. I know that they all say we're going to save the world. We're not going to buy oil from Texas. Well, OK, fine. But then you shouldn't buy oil from anywhere, if that's your view. You certainly shouldn't buy oil from horrible people like you say the Iranians are horrible. You say the Venezuelans are horrible. Why are we buying oil from horrible people? It still hurts the environment. But Michelle, you should, you should ask Mr. Biden. I, I, to me, it's unfathomable that Washington would say, we're not going to buy American oil, but we will buy Iranian oil. Not just to you, Jim, not just to you. Many people share that sentiment. Uh, you're making a lot of sense. And I guess so. Uh, we'll see if that has any implications on the U.S. political landscape uh, come the midterms. But hopefully we will get a chance to catch up again before then. I've taken way too much of your time because it's always such a pleasure chatting with you. So again, thank you so much, Jim. Always great to hear your insights on all matters. Well, I'm keen, Michelle. I'm still a fan, so I hope we can do it again sometime. I hope okay. we all survive. That's the good news. We'll all survive and we'll get some agricultural commodity exposure. All right. <laughs> well done. All right, bye -bye. Jim. Thank you.